Hello, everybody. Welcome to this talk. Um, my name is Jose Garduño, and the title of the talk is C2 Centipede. It's actually the name of a tool I made uh, to try to evade certain type of blue team um, detection strategies. Um, a little bit about me. Um, okay, I was born in Mexico. I took a small detour. Um, I ended up in Switzerland after 15 years of wandering around. Um, I'm a C senior security consultant for Dream Lab Technologies. And I have been um, in the audit team since uh, the year 2014. So basically pen testing, infrastructure, applications, and so on. I have been a speaker uh, previously in other um, conferences. I would actually recommend you, um, especially the ones in Latin America, um, very nice and uh, fun places to be. Okay, so let's start. Uh, why are you here? Why are you watching this? Uh, so you are a red teamer and you know, and you want to know how your tools work. So you use Metasploit or Empire and a little bit of how it works. It's magic to you. Like uh, how do you get the shell? What's happening uh, behind the scenes? Uh, also, it could be that you are not an APT, but you want to emulate uh, more advanced scenarios than what the default vanilla Metasploit or Empire can give you. Um, also, you want interactive shell without getting detected by your tools beaconing. Okay, so this is one reason for the red teamers. And for the blue team, uh, of course, how can you catch the bad guys now? Uh, I will talk about some techniques, how you can do it right now. And of course, uh, with the techniques presented here, um, what's maybe coming next. Um, so you can see um, <clears throat> what the bad guys are planning. So the context of these, um, basically, I, I just approached the, the blue team, the SOP team at Dream Lab, uh, because I, I wanted to learn uh, their techniques. Basically, I'm a little bit uh, maybe sometimes too focused on the offensive part and yeah, you just uh, hope uh, they don't catch you or yeah uh, so 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 this was a little bit of finding out what the blue team uh, is doing now uh, what techniques they use what tools they use and maybe how i could evade them uh, the talk is about this journey to try to evade uh, the blue team detection on the network only so I will not talk about um, antivirus evasion or any other um, host-based evasion. Um, in this tool, I implemented some techniques, techniques used by APTs, um, and I will briefly go over some vulnerabilities I discovered along the way. Um, okay, so uh, the basic objectives as an adversary, especially, uh, let's say, a red team adversary, is to maintain access in the organization and to, to have this interactive command uh, with the hosts inside the organization and maybe exfiltrate uh, some data. You also, you also want to have a resilient uh, command and control infrastructure. So basically, um, maybe the, the blue team will try to block you or um, they will try to bring down your infrastructure as well. Um, and then how can you do this uh, <clears throat> while staying as anonymous as possible? So we will discuss uh, that as well. So basically, uh, I just started surveying what techniques are APTs using. Uh, most of them are used with botnets, so like FastFlux networks, where there is a domain name that responds with several or very many IPs to, to every request they get. So this is why they get the, the name FastFlux. Uh, and basically they, they botnets, for example, have um, the, or they install like a proxy. So they can use uh, all of these, um, all of these uh, infected hosts to, um, to proxy the, uh, the traffic from the victim to the command and control server. Um, also, they use, um, especially for, for botnets as well, uh, domain generation algorithms. So basically, 
um, adversaries don't have to uh, hard, co hard code um, a domain name that maybe if, if they do reverse engineering, they can maybe sinkhole it or if, if they uh, add some hard coded IPs, um, they can just perform some um, maybe a sandbox analysis or something like this and get the IP and then just block it, right? So this is why they use domain generation algorithms. Also, uh, a very common technique uh, for hiding uh, malicious traffic is domain fronting. Um, and yeah, I will, I will talk about that and how all of this is somehow integrated in the tool. So uh, let's talk about shells. So basically a shell allows you to uh, execute interactive uh, commands in, in a host, right? That you, you have already um, owned via phishing or ex an exploit or something like this. Um, there are basically two types of shells. Um, the bind shell, which listens on the target or on the victim. Basically, uh, the malware opens a port on the on the victim host and then the attacker uh, connects to the victim in that port and uh, starts executing uh, commands there um, this works when there is not a firewall here or maybe uh, maybe this user is natted so the uh, attacker has uh, difficulty reaching the, the the victim inside this natted network or through this firewall so the alternative is a reverse shell. A reverse shell uh, is the other way around. Instead of the attacker connecting uh, to the victim, the, the roles are inversed. So the attacker um, opens a port in, in his machine or, or in a server he controls, and then um, the malware he executes on the victim makes the connection back to his uh, server. Some types of reverse shells uh, with a basic simple TCP connection like I just talked about uh, with Netcat or <clears throat> like this very simple, very typical uh, Vash uh, reverse shell. Another way is to have a HTTP reverse shell. So basically here the attacker hosts an HTTP service <clears throat> and the victim connects to it uh, asking for commands to execute. So basically the, the victim connects, says, uh, do I have something to execute? And the, um, the server says then, uh, yes, you, you can execute this. The victim will execute it and will send the result back to the attacker. Why choose uh, reverse HTTP shells? So outgoing HTTP traffic is usually allowed in enterprise networks. Um, lot, there is a lot of traffic to blend in. Um, there are also different, uh, very uh, wide variety of content inside this HTTP uh, traffic where, um, where you can hide uh, your command and control communications. Uh, additionally, techniques like domain fronting can help you uh, hide uh, this traffic, this malicious traffic. Then uh, let's look at a specific example on how Metasploit um, reverse shell uh, payload uh, works. So basically you have here the Metasploit handler and uh, in the other side, you have a Metapreter or, or the Metasploit uh, Trojan. <clears throat> when you execute it, uh, the Trojan, uh, it makes a request, a get request uh, to the server uh, asking if there are any commands that it needs to execute. If there are none, the, the server uh, response uh, with the HTTP response, uh, there is nothing you should execute. The Trojan then waits for 10 seconds and it uh, asks again the same thing. Uh, in the meanwhile, an attacker can say, okay, I want this uh, Trojan to actually execute this command. So the next time the interpreter goes to the HTTP server and asks, do you got a command for me? The, um, this HTTP server will actually respond, yes, I have a command that I need you to execute. So the Trojan will execute it and then will post with the HTTP uh, post request, <clears throat> will post the result. So as you can see, there are like this uh, very continuous uh, <clears throat> request. This is called a beacon. 
how is actually the beaconing implemented in Metasploit? So I said 10 seconds uh, before, um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but uh, not so much. So when Metasploit, con or when the Trojan of Metasploit, the Meterpreter connects uh, to the server, the initial interval uh, between each connection is about uh, one tenth of a second. So 100 milliseconds. And every time the Trojan doesn't get any task to execute, it adds another uh, 100 milliseconds. So uh, the interval starts growing until it's 10 seconds. After it's 10 seconds, it just keeps uh, the interval at 10 seconds. So it just asks, um, do you have a task for me? No. Do you have a task for me? No. And so on uh, every 10 seconds. When it actually has a task for uh, for for this Trojan, then uh, the delay becomes again uh, 100 milliseconds, and then starts uh, increasing the interval. Uh, you can see how it's in, in implemented actually, and in the Python uh, interpreter, in the Java interpreter, and so on. So, how do you detect these with very simple statistics? So, uh, there is a great project called Rita, a tool um, to, to detect this beaconing behavior. So they use uh, uh, basically just statistics uh, with this interval, the sizes, and so on. Uh, it's made by active countermeasures. Uh, they, they have some uh, threat hunting labs where you can actually um, test all of this. Um, you can install a security onion, which is a distribution that I could say is like the Kali for blue team. So if you want to test uh, all of these tools like Rita, uh, Kivana, and all of that, uh, it's a very easy um, way to, to test it, actually. If you want to learn a little bit more about uh, beaconing, uh, you should really check uh, this, um, uh, these resources. So the beaconing detection in Rita, uh, actually the, the, <clears throat> the source code, it's in GitHub and it's very well documented. Actually, you can see here uh, how they are um, basically scoring the, the, the beacons. Uh, they, they do um, a, a scoring based on interval of each of the connections, the number of the connections between two hosts, the data size of, of the... <clears throat> of the data in, in these connections, the dispersion, which is like, okay, you have intervals of 10 seconds, but maybe you vary by maybe plus minus two seconds around this uh, 10 second interval. So that's the dispersion. Uh, the, the really great thing is that it's protocol independent. So you can have uh, a Trojan that connects via DNS or one that connects via HTTP or a custom uh, TCP or whatever uh, protocol, and it will be still uh, detected by uh, Rita <clears throat> because they just uh, focus on on the connections, not in the uh, in the content of the connections. So the thing is, uh, I, I saw that the that Rita focuses on IP pairs. So basically, you have a source of the communication and then a destination. So this is uh, basically saying that uh, you will have <clears throat> your compromised host on one side and then just one uh, command and control server. This is the usual case, actually. So this is where uh, the whole idea of implementing this tool uh, was born, actually. So what are the possible evasion strategies um, for Rita? So I thought maybe if I beacon less often, I can uh, reduce the, um, the score. Also, if I modify the interval and add some jitter, which is the deviation of the periodic signal, uh, I could also uh, affect it. <clears throat> you can modify the interval uh, of, of your normal, uh, let's say, command and control uh, interaction. If you just, uh, in Metasploit, you just use the command sleep. This will just stop all the connections and then resume them after the uh, number of seconds that you specify. Then I thought, 
Okay, so if Rita is making the analysis on IP pairs, maybe I should distribute the the all the connections that the infected host makes to the C2 to go through several or many um, command and control addresses. You can do this also with Metasploit uh, transports, but I wanted to make a, a more generic and a little bit more uh, dynamic uh, way of doing it. So where can we get multiple IP addresses for our command and control? Well, the first thing I thought about was uh, using reverse HTTP and reverse TCP proxies. So I started by doing a survey of reverse HTTP and reverse TCP software and services. Some of the services I found was localhost.run, which is basically a SSH uh, service that you can do a reverse uh, tunnel with it. Uh, Ngrok, which is also a very popular uh, service um, where you can do HTTP and TCP uh, proxying and PageKite. Local tunnel uh, is very interesting because they also um, they also have the, the, the code in, in GitHub, so you can host your own server for local tunnel, and you can also use uh, their service. And then FRP and Venom. FRP and Venom I found in the Mitre attack um, page. So I started by searching how many FRP, uh, which is fast reverse proxy, actually the name, um, I found uh, 15,731 from those, uh, well, the majority was hosted in China, actually, then the United States and Hong Kong. Uh, of all of those, I found 810 that were um, open, meaning no authentication uh, to establish uh, a, a TCP uh, reverse tunnel, and 416 for establishing uh, reverse HTTP uh, connections. Um, well, this was actually fantastic news for me uh, because I I said, okay, if I wanted uh, more IPs to send the traffic of my command and control, well, now I have more than 1000 IPs on my on my disposal. So that this was great news actually. Then local tunnel, um, I found 290. Uh, uh, you can do reverse HTTP proxying through it. Uh, the C2 Centipede uh, features that I implemented is uh, the modification of the beaconing interval, uh, the, the type of Trojan detection. So it detects if you are using a meterpreter or if you are using an empire agent or any other, well, not any other, but uh, other generic responses. Uh, the Fox flux um, part is just uh, sending, let's say many IPs uh, to the client, so it can uh, <clears throat> not directly send the request to the command and control, but through these many uh, IPs. The multi-fronting is just uh, domain fronting, but that is not uh, actually just uh, um, using one domain. So you can send uh, many uh, domains that you want to uh, front through uh, in one CDN or two or n uh, amount of CDNs. Uh, I also implemented the domain generation algorithm of uh, Fluebot uh, and uh, DGA uh, kind of thing for uh, generating the, the the virtual hosts for the FRP reverse uh, proxying. You don't have to configure everything uh, before uh, sending the Trojan. So the Trojan can establish one connection on, let's say, one uh, of all of these ways. And then um, it can just um, alter, like add more IP addresses or change the beaconing interval or all of this stuff uh, dynamically. So how do we change the uh, beaconing interval? We have seen, for example, the Metasploit case that it has its own um, beaconing uh, strategy, let's say sending a beacon every 10 seconds. So. Uh, what we're doing in the C2 Centipede is just uh, faking the response of what uh, Metasploit Handler would say to say uh, there are no tasks for you to execute. So it connects 10 times and you can say, okay, instead of sending 
10 times, which is uh, a lot of beaconing for, for my taste, just fake uh, 20 times saying that there are no tasks. And then uh, the 21st uh, attempt that you want to communicate with the command and control, then you actually send it. And then the rest, uh, again, 20, you don't send it and then and so on. So the beaconing gets reduced uh, a lot. The Fox Flux, uh, as I was saying, is basically not using DNS because I don't have a botnet available. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I do want to use many IPs. So we are using the, uh, let's say, uh, reverse open reverse proxy approach. And uh, so there is a kind of a um, DGA uh, that is used on both the client and the server. Uh, when the server requests um, <clears throat> um, a reverse HTTP uh, tunnel from a FRP server, uh, it converts the IP of this server into a host. So you can you can see here uh, news.biohub.io is generated by uh, this IP that is here. So uh, when the C2 Centipede server tells the client, okay, now we sh you should uh, send um, your, your request through this uh, FRP uh, proxy, uh, both uh, server and client know uh, how to set up the, the, the proxy by telling uh, FRP, I want to use this uh, host. And then the, uh, the client all, also has the same algorithm, so knows what host to send in the HTTP request so that the, the HTTP request goes from the, um, <clears throat> from the C, uh, C2 Centipede serve, uh, client to the server. So <clears throat> multi-domain fronting, uh, basically uh, uh, domain fronting uh, abuses the routing scheme in content delivery networks to hide the intended destination of the HTTPS traffic. So basically, uh, let's say that the TLS uh, outer wrapping is saying, hey, I want to go to uh, Amazon or whatever. But inside, uh, the HTTP header is saying, uh, not really, I don't want to go to Amazon. I want to go to evil server dot uh, whatever in the same CDN. So the CDN uh actually like unwraps this tls stuff and then just uh, routes um the request to the um specific to the server specified in the http host header <clears throat> this is very easily um implemented in in the tool you just need to send uh, um like this front it and then the domain you want to front through and then you specify the host uh, that you have assigned in that CDN. You can use uh, one, two CDNs as, as you wish. Then the domain generation algorithm, uh, I already talked a little bit about it. Uh, I implemented uh, the Flubot, uh, actually based a lot on uh, this uh, blog post uh, on switch.ch. Uh, Basically, Flubot uh, has a, um, an algorithm that uh, you provide the seed. Then you say how many domains you want to generate. And uh, here in the C2 Centipede, you specify to what port uh, you want to connect on those generated uh, domains. And then the dynamic configuration. Uh, basically, you have um, uh, every time the Trojan wants to connect to the C2 server, it connects to the actually to the C2 centipede uh, proxy first, uh, <clears throat> and then the the C2 centipede uh, let's say protocol is piggybacked on this call. Um, the original um, request from the Trojan it's kind of wrapped and then sent to the C2 centipede uh, server where it's unwrapped then uh, the, the original request is passed to the Metasploit handler or the Empire handler. Uh, and then the control data for the C2 Centipede um, application, it's uh, embedded and wrapped and sent 
to the C2 Centipede client. Then, so this means that the operator can add more C2 addresses, uh, change the encryption key. Also, this uh, this whole thing it's encrypted uh, on top of the encryption of Metasploit. If you're using Metasploit, um, you can change the no the number of fake answers it sends at any moment. Um, so so you can change it while it's running. Here we have the C2 Centipede architecture. Uh, well. This is the, the normal architecture that you use uh, in, in when, when you have a normal meterpreter, uh, a Trojan, that connects directly to the handler. Then this connection is repeated every 10 seconds, every time to the same server. What we want to achieve uh, is connect through many uh, IPs, let's say, and uh, to alter the, the the beaconing interval. So um, <clears throat> basically, the meterpreter, instead of connecting directly to the handler, it connects to this sort of um, proxy. The C2 centipede uh, proxy uh, then uh, has like an internal routing uh, table and it decides on the um, desired uh, route, route it wants to take to reach the handler. So uh, the Trojan sends the request to the local host uh, and then uh, the set to centipede client chooses one of these can be through the main fronting or through a reverse uh, frp reverse tunnel and then it reaches the c2 centipede server the c2 centipede server kind of uh, unwraps the original uh, call and sends it to the uh, destination metasploit http handler then uh, it obtains the response and sends it back to the C2 Centipede client and then from there to the uh, Meterpreter client, or to the Meterpreter uh, Trojan. You can also have this configuration where you have uh, one host um, with a Meterpreter and also with the C2 Centipede uh, client. And then you can have other compromised hosts in that same network connecting to this one only uh, host with the C2 centipede client so that all the traffic goes through uh, this uh, host and does all this routing for them. So uh, this is the C2 centipede operation. Basically, you need first to set up the Metasploit, Empire, or whatever you're using a handler. Uh, so basically, this is uh, the command. To, uh, to set up a Metasploit handler, you set the payload for uh, whatever, pay, uh, whatever payload you want. Uh, it has to be reverse HTTP. Uh, here I'm using a stageless HTTP shell. Um, then you set up the port of the handler and then the host you want to bind to and you run the Metasploit handler. Then you need to configure on the server as well um, the C2 Centipede server. You need to specify a port and then the destination where all the um, requests that it gets will be uh, forwarded to. So this will be the Metasploit or Empire um, handler. Then on the client, uh, you need to uh, set up the uh, C2 Centipede client. You specify the on what interface you want to bind. And this is in the case of just having it in one host, not anyone else connecting to it. You specify the port that you want to run the C2 Centipede client on. Uh, then the list of C2 Centipede servers, let's say, uh, either domain fronted or, um, or through FRP proxies. Uh, or you can also give uh, with the minus S, you can give the individual uh, servers. Of course, then you need to generate the Trojan um, and then, uh, yeah, you just need to execute uh, the, the Trojan in the same host that you are uh, executing the C2 Centipede client. Uh, of course, you, you can also compile it uh, for Windows um, and then just uh, run it there. Uh, Okay, so right now we will um, test um, okay, a shell with C2 Centipede. So 
we will um, actually fire up a Windows machine. Uh, we will set up the C2 Centipede server. Uh, we will set up the port in 1993, and then we will say that the Metasploit handler will be in this host and IP. In this case, it's on the same machine, but you can also, uh, let's say, point to a Metasploit handler in another machine. So here I will, um, with Metasploit, I will run a handler. So I will use the exploit multi handler and then set the payload for Windows Metapreter reverse HTTP. This is a stageless um, HTTP um, payload. And uh, we set the port to 8888. Then we set the host to all interfaces and then just run. And we can start as well the C2 Centipede uh, server on port 1993. Okay. So we already have the multi handler uh, listening on, on that uh, port with this payload. We can start the C2 Centipede client. We need to specify um, uh, to what interface we're binding to, and then the port. Let's use uh, port 2233, because I already generated uh, a stageless uh, meterpreter pointing to localhost and port 2233. And then we will connect it, uh, specifying the C2 centipede server It was running on port 1993. Okay, that should be running. We can test the connection all the way to the handler by issuing a crawl command to localhost. So this is the actual response from the Metasploit HTTP handler. It uh, actually emulates uh, an Apache server. But you can see that the connection actually was sent through the C2 Centipede client and to sent to the C2 Centipede server, as you can see here. We execute the curl again. Then you get the connection again through the same a route and here we can see the connections okay so let's now execute the meterpreter what what you hear is every connection that gets to the c2 centipede uh, server so you will see how much the metasploit or the meterpreter uh, trojan connects to the handler. Every beep is a connection, an HTTP request action. And as you can hear, the interval between each call, it's little by little growing. So if we continue, we could um, see that the interval grows until 10 seconds, and then it just keeps uh, being 10 seconds long. But what happens when we interact with uh, the Trojan? We said that it goes back to 100 uh, milliseconds, and then it, 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 it does like this um, growing of the interval again. So let's interact with it. As you can see, there are more connections now. Okay, I will execute something again. So this 
is all the noise that you are generating every time that your um, uh, meterpreter connects to your handler. So it's not uh, magic, it generates a lot of noise and actually quite very nice looking beacons uh, all the time. So this is very easy for the um, blue team to detect with a tool like uh, Rita. So this is where we come and try to do things a little bit different. This is the c 2 centipede operator uh, interface. We say to what server we are connecting to, and then we can see the clients that are currently connected. Okay. We can set up uh, another route, right? We will set up, uh, or let's first uh, fake the, the responses, okay? I will just execute one more command to get a faster beacon, beaconing. And then I will send uh, the command to fake four uh, requests, the responses for four requests. As you can see here, it's now one, two, three. You don't hear anything because nothing is going through the network. Here you will also see the gap. Now it sent again the, the, the request. So you see, this was the original beaconing and with the C2 centipede, we are now adding this gap. So adding to the interval. We are now only faking four responses, but we can do, of course, more. We can go back to zero if we want more interactivity. Here you can see how many uh, times it has faked, right? So it starts again. Faked one, fake two out of four, fake three out of four, fake four out of four, and then it will go again out, as you can see now. So uh, let's say uh you want more interactivity ah of course uh, i can show that you can still retain uh let's see it will take a little bit longer because not all requests are coming but now it will execute it so you can still execute commands so now let's add some um proxies so let's try So we will set up some, let's try three or four. So these are open on the internet. I will just press set up. And then it will establish the connections. As you can see, these two are not uh, no longer uh, working. So we can actually remove them. Okay, remove that one. So let's add some other ones. That it worked. Let's add another one. Okay, that one worked. So let's send it to the C2 client. The C2 centipede client. So I will press send. So the next time it connects, because now it's faking. So when it connects, it will get the servers, add it to its routing table, and then it will actually use it to route the traffic through them. OK. 
can see I still have command over the Trojan and actually the frequency of the beeps uh, means that it's using uh, like each uh, IP generates a different frequency so here if we see it will be using like these IPs we added so this is going through China and the, the US and so on okay so we can also use uh, the main fronting um, as, as we saw previously I will just um, again using uh, this tool I will send multiple servers and we add them here with the uh, format I was uh, telling you before fronted and then the domain you want to front through and then the host uh, it should actually redirect so there it will send it it adds the to the routing table and then it will use them so here it sent through this one There are some debugging uh, things uh, going on, so at some point it uh, stops, uh, but then it continues. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the domains that it's using to front here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the demo. Uh, I hope you liked it, uh, and we'll continue with the presentation. Okay, so um, how does uh, the traffic looks for the blue team? Here, uh, I executed uh, the meterpreter against uh, this host only, only one host, uh, using no uh, sleeping, let's say, or faking, uh, just direct connections. Uh, as you saw here, um, there are six, uh, all of this is uh, one minute, uh, intervals so uh, there is uh, six uh, requests per minute you have here uh, this uh, big peak when you execute the who is command uh, so you can see there are like many many more uh, connections in, in a in a in a minute um, and then it uses that algorithm from metasploit and then just reaches uh, 10 per uh, uh, one request every uh, 10 seconds so six per minute and here uh, Rita this is already the output from Rita it gives a score of 70 percent um, to that IP that we were beaconing to uh, here we have to to specify that this is just like half an hour of, of it running uh, of course when you do this uh, beaconing detection with Rita you want much bigger um amounts of time like the traffic for a day or, or more uh here just for the experiment of, of and for the proof of concept we just have uh nine uh sorry um uh, half half an hour uh, period of time so this is the normal way and then how does it look when we do it with the c2 centipede so we for this test, we added uh, 10 IPs. Uh, these are uh, 10 FRP HTTP reverse uh, proxies. And then uh, we set some uh, faking of the responses so that it doesn't become so often. Okay. Uh, so the result is this, that sometimes uh, you have uh, many more, well, not that many actually, uh, but, um, at some point you you have some request and then it doesn't fake for a while and then you have periods of time uh, that for five minutes for example you don't have any beacon and then you can see that um, at this point of time it uses one server then here maybe it uses the same maybe here it uses another one and then it uses the green one the blue one the green one the pink one and so on so 
uh, the beaconing uh, is not a perfect beaconing, so that tools like Rita uh, don't uh, see these perfect uh, beacons. Okay, so uh, the results from Rita uh, also by this uh, half an hour uh, period of time uh, is that it doesn't see a beaconing um, uh, pattern basically because there are less beacons and because it is routed through several uh, C, uh, C2 IPs. So we can conclude, at least for this very small experiment, that it is uh, like mission accomplished, at, this, at least for this. So the conclusion is basically that the beaconing is, of course, not the only threat hunting technique, but one that blue teams should be doing. So if you are using the default vanilla Metasploit uh, Empire, know that if the blue team is doing beaconing detection, it will jump right at the blue team. It's very visible. But also, if you use uh, thousands of servers uh, to proxy uh, to your uh, command and control uh, server, of course, uh, because it's not the only threat hunting technique, this uh, beaconing detection, uh, you will be detected because the host is connecting to these so many servers. So you need to balance. It's a balancing act of how often you want to beacon and so uh, how, mo uh, how much uh, interactivity you are willing to, to lose. Uh, and also how stealthy you want to be. Uh, if you use really many uh, servers, then you will be more visible. So you, you have to uh, balance this, uh, all, all of these uh, things. Okay, so that was all. Uh, I would like to, to thank you. Uh, it's a shame that I, of course, uh, most of us could not be there in DEF CON. Actually, I wished it was my first time there, um, but uh, that's how it goes. I wish you are safe and that um, you can uh, maybe contact me, give me a little bit of feedback and uh, maybe chat or something like that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, see you later.